Ephesians chapter 5, the part that I want to focus on is toward the end of the chapter, beginning in verse number 23, where the Bible talks about the husband and the wife and Christ and the church. And I want to keep your finger here, if you would, and flip over to Matthew chapter 15. So keep your finger in Ephesians chapter 5 and then flip over in your Bible to Matthew 15. And I want to read another portion of scripture. And the title of my sermon this morning is this, The Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ. Now that's, that's something that you've probably heard talked about in churches, and it's, it's something that you'll hear mentioned a lot in churches, and in people talking about the Bible and Bible doctrine in the church, and yet it's something that's mentioned very seldom in the Bible, in those words. But we're going to look at it because there are a lot of misconceptions about it that we're going to clear up this morning, and look at Matthew chapter 15. And I'm going to deal with this subject in, in great detail this morning. But in Matthew 15, verse 1, the Bible reads, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Okay, so here are Jesus' disciples. They eat a meal without washing their hands. And the Pharisees are getting angry with them, saying, Why are they eating without washing their hands? They're transgressing God's word? No. They're transgressing the tradition of the elders, he said. So watch what Jesus says in verse 3. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the dead. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made... The commandments of God of none effect by your tradition, ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy to you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now let me explain something to you. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are those who base what they believe and live by on the commandments of God. And there are those who base what they believe and how they live on the traditions of men. That's right. Now, a lot of people will add rules. Are you listening to me? They'll add rules that God did not have. And they'll impress those rules upon other people and say, You must live by my rules. You must live by my preaching. You must live by what I say. And those rules are not found in the Bible. You say, well, is there anything wrong with living by rules that are not found in the Bible? Well, the problem is, the same people who try to add all these rules on that are not in the Bible, they're the same people who will throw out other of God's rules out the back door. See, that's who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were not people who lived a strict life according to God's word. They were people who lived a strict life according to their own rules and their own traditions, and they threw God's rules out. They were not obeying God's laws. Jesus gives an example here. And it's amazing how whenever you try to preach and teach God's laws from the Bible, you'll try to point to the law of the Lord where he, he states all through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, he's teaching what's right and what's wrong. And they'll say, oh, well, that's the Old Testament. And you'll try to point out to them scriptures in the Bible like the one that talks about, you know, a, a woman should not wear that which pertains to a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. God says it's a sin for a man to wear a woman's clothing. For a woman to wear a man's clothing. And they'll say, well, wait a minute. In the same chapter, it says to stone a rebellious child. Right? And they'll say, oh, it's the same for Deuteronomy 22. But look here. Jesus is rebuking them for throwing out that commandment. He says that if somebody curses their father or their mother, Jesus Christ, I mean, I just read it, said that they should be killed for that. I mean, that's a wicked sin. To, to, to damn your parents to hell. You know, that's what he's saying. You know, to curse them and, and say that type of thing to them. And, and he's, he, Jesus here is rebuking them for throwing out God's word, for throwing out God's commandments and not living by every word of God. And so you see, there are two kinds of people. Those who make their own rules, their own laws, their own traditions, and those who say, the Bible is my authority, and what the Bible says goes... If it says in the Bible, I believe it. I don't care what man says. I don't care what Pastor Anderson says. I don't care what I learned growing up. God's word must reign supreme for what we believe, for how we live, for what we do. Not tradition, not man's rules. And that's why at Faithful Word Baptist Church, we have no rules. Amen. We walk according to this rule. Yeah. And it's preached from the pulpit, and it's enforced by God. 
And we don't go around telling people what to do and, and how to act. Where, you know, I get up and preach the Bible. I expound it. I interpret it. But I'm not going to come to you and tell you what to do. I'm not going to make all these man-made rules and, 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 and laws that are not found in the Bible. Let me give you some examples. There are churches where in order to be a member of the church, you must sign a, a paper. I'll do this and I won't do this and I won't do that. Who's ever, who's ever had to sign something like that? Good night. Who's ever heard of somebody signing something like that? You just heard me say it. <laughs> the point is, people sit there and sign on. That, you know, and, and it's funny because they'll sign one that says, like, I will not drink alcohol, you know, I will not do this, I won't do this. And one of them is, you know, I won't go to the movie house or something. Right? You know what I'm talking about. It's in there. But the funny thing is, the same people who will teach a tradition of men and preach it's a sin to go to the movie theater will then watch the exact same movie on their television right. screen. Yeah. Tell me, what's the difference? I mean, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. Either it's a sin to watch the movie, period, or it's a sin whether you're watching it standing on your head or on your couch at home or at the movie theater. It's the movie that's the problem. And see, this is what I'm talking about. People will have their traditions and their rules and their little guidelines where you sign a paper to, to join the church. The Bible doesn't say you have to sign a paper to join the church. This is how you join the church. You're saved, and then you get baptized, and then you're added to the church. Period. I mean, that's it. Oh, well, you've got to fit these guidelines. You've got to go through a class. You mean catechism? No, we're not Roman Catholics here. It's a Baptist church. We don't have catechism or uh, membership classes with just catechism with a different name. Do you hear me? Amen. That's what it is, okay? Uh, baptism classes, which is catechism with another name. We don't do that here because the Bible is our only authority, Amen. not some man-made tradition or set of theology. And so we've got to be very careful as we go into this subject right now to understand that the Bible must rule, not man's tradition or man's philosophies. Look at what is uh, written here in Ephesians 5, if you go back there. The Bible reads, For the husband is the head of the wife, in verse 23, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now here, God is using an illustration here between Jesus Christ and the church as Jesus being the husband and the church being the wife. Do you see that? Now here's the thing. Is there only one church in this world? No. The Bible uses the word churches, plural, 37 times. He talks about churches. Because a church is a congregation, an assembly. You're sitting in a church. Not the building, but the people that are here make up a church. There's not only one church. You say, well, but wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. It says Christ is the head of the church. Well, but look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Is there only one husband in this world? No. Is there only one wife? No, but every, every husband is supposed to be the head of his household. <coughs> every husband is supposed to be the head of his household. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible teaches. And he says here that Christ is the head of every church. To be, have Jesus Christ the head. But look what he says here. Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, look at verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now watch verse 27. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now let me ask something. Does this church have any faults? Of course it does, right? Faith and Baptist Church is, is made up of human beings. Pastor Harris is a human being. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. And so this church that's being presented to Jesus Christ, this is talking about Revelation 19 at the marriage supper of the Lamb, when the church at the group there, the body of all believers, is presented as the bride of Christ. We're going to see that in a minute. Without spot. Without wrinkle, because the flesh will be gone. You know, this is after after the rapture and after uh, the, the flesh is dead. It's just the, the new body and, and everything like that after the resurrection. And so we see here that with this presentation of the church to Christ is talking about when it's perfect. When it has no spot, no wrinkle. We're talking about in the future now uh, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so it says here in verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. 
For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two, they two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You see that? So this is a parable, right? This is an illustration here. The husband's head of the wife, Christ head of the church. The husband loves the wife, you know, Christ loves the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence, that's talking about have being respectful toward her husband. Now turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> Keep a finger in Ephesians 5, though, and, and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And here's the thing. Before, before I read for you Hebrews chapter 12, I want to teach you the definition of a really of a really difficult word, you know, for some people. Now, for some people, this word is very easy to understand. Other people just really struggle with this word. Especially these guys that have, like, master's degrees and doctorates and, and these theologians that are in these cemeteries, I mean seminaries, and they're, they're learning all this deep doctrine and they go down deep and stay down long and come up dry. Okay, these guys have a real hard time with this English word. Now, they know the Greek and the Hebrew. But they struggle with this English word. I'm going to unlock the mysteries of this word today. And that word is the word and. A-N-D. Okay? Now look at Ephesians 5. I mean, we're going deep here. Because this is a word. Listen. This is a word that I've sat and listened to Baptists with so many letters after their name, it can almost make up the whole alphabet. And they did not understand this word. I'm going to show it to you this morning. And then we're going to give you a degree at the door as you walk out. An honorary doctor from the Lord Baptist Church. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, and, and this is going to shock you this morning. Look at Ephesians 5.20. We're going to learn that the word and has two meanings. You're not going to believe this. It can either mean two things that are different, or two things that are the same. Right? People, I've heard preacher, preacher get up and say, oh, see, it says and, two different things. Two different things. Well, okay, let's see. Let's put that to the test. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, be, be very careful now to separate <laughs> God from the Father. See what I'm saying? Doesn't make any sense, does it? No, because God and the Father, it's the same person. And is often used to restate the same thing. The same subject. The word and in the Bible, hundreds of times, separates two things that are the same. Hundreds of other times it separates two things that are different, okay? And see, if you study foreign languages, you you know, some other languages actually have two different words for and. One for things that are different and one for things that are the same. But in English, it's just A and B, all right? And so, look at, that's Ephesians 5. Look, if you would, at Colossians 1.13. I mean, Colossians 1.3. Just a few pages to the right in your Bible. Colossians 1.3. We're trying to learn the definition. We're probing the Bible, finding the definition of the word and. Look at Colossians 1.3. The Bible reads, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, according to these theologians, I guess God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ are two different people? Of course not. He says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus It's the same thing. It's being restated. Uh, look at now on to uh, Colossians 3.17. Just a few page, one page over in your Bible, look at Colossians 3.17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Are we talking about one person or two different people? The same person. God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same person. Look at James 1.27. This is the last one I'll show you. But I could go on and on. I've, I've made lists of just scores of examples of this all throughout the Bible. And I'd like to say to these theologians, instead of trying to learn Greek and Hebrew and going down and all these deep languages, maybe they ought to start by learning English. <laughs> I mean, if they live in America, they're preaching to people, they're preaching to people who speak English, they're reading out the English Bible, the King James Bible, maybe they should learn the English language and understand what it means. Look at James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Look at that another restatement. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now look at James 12, 22. I know I'm having you turn a lot, but just back up a few pages to James, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12, 22. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, 
That's where Jerusalem was located. And unto the city of the living God. Two different places? No. Same place. You see what I'm saying about the word and? You come unto Mount Zion, and it's also the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. These are all the same place, okay? And to an innumerable company of angels. Watch verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's one item there. The general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. What does it mean to be written in heaven? Jesus said, rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. That's talking about having your name in the Lamb's book of life. That means that you're saved and a child of God at this point, then your name is in the Lamb of the book of life in heaven. In Hebrews 12, he says, written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So we see here that in heaven, there's a church in heaven. Do you see that? Up in the heavenly Jerusalem right now, not the earthly Jerusalem, not the city that denies Christ, not the physical city of Jerusalem where the Jews have rejected Christ and deny Christ, the, the city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, according to Revelation 11, the city that is called Mount Sinai in Galatians 4, which gendereth the bondage, which is called Hagar, but the heavenly Jerusalem in heaven, Mount Zion, the, 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 the fir church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, the general assembly, up in heaven right now, there is a church of believers in heaven. Now listen. He says here that we are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God. Now are we really there yet? No. But he, you know, God sees all from an omnipresent, omniscient. He stands back and sees all of time, past, present, and future. And one day we will be in heaven at this great church in heaven. After the rapture takes place and, and we're all up in heaven, all believers of all ages, all the way from Abel, all the way until the last believer of the New Testament, I mean, we will all be together in heaven in this great church service, singing praises to God. It will be people of all nations, the Bible says, all languages, all peoples, all kindreds of the earth, will all be joined together in that great assembly, the general assembly, the church of the firstborn in heaven, singing praises to God one day. And by the way, why, why, why are there churches that segregate by race and by uh, nationality on this earth if the church in heaven is all nations? Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And yet there are still churches that will segregate by, by race, believe it or not, in this country. That will segregate by nationality. He says, in, uh, turn if you would to Revelation 21 now. Revela Actually, look at Revelation 19, and then we'll flip over to Revelation 21. So, we're, we're trying to understand what is the bride of Christ. Now, let me ask you something. When does a bride become a bride? When, when she starts dating a guy? Is she known as the bride? When they're engaged, is she now the bride? No. When does she become the bride? On her wedding day. Isn't that the truth? I mean, until then, she might just be the fiancé or the girlfriend. But when she's the bride is on the wedding day, she is the bride. Correct? That's why the bride is not mentioned much throughout the Bible. Okay? Because it talks about, you know, uh, a parable about Christ, uh, the head of the church, and the husband's the head of the wife. But in, nowhere does it mention the word bride between John chapter 3. It mentions it one time in John chapter 3. We're talking just in the New Testament, the word bride. Mentions it once in John chapter 3, and then it doesn't mention it again all the way until the end of the book of Revelation. Okay? Let me show you why. Look at Revelation 19. And look at verse number... Let me see here, I lost my place. Revelation 9, verse 6. 19, verse 6, I'm sorry. The Bible says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, 19.6, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunder, is saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Do you see that? And his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, 
These are the true sayings of God. So we see here that at the end of the book of Revelation, I mean, we're talking about the very end, right before the millennial reign of Christ, that's when the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. And that's when he said, okay, the bride has made herself ready. Jesus Christ is ready to receive his bride, which is what? The faith war Baptist church? No. Which is what? All the independent Baptist churches in America? No. Which is the church in heaven, perfect, without spot, without wrinkle, being presented to Jesus Christ. I mean, look, I'm going to sin until I die. The Bible says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Everyone is a sinner. There's none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. But if we're saved, then one day when we breathe our last breath, the flesh will be gone and we will live in heaven perfectly without sinning ever again, once the flesh is gone. And so this church, this bride of Christ that's being presented to Christ, is not any church that's on this earth today or existing today or any denomination today or any group of churches today, but a group that will be presented to Christ one day in Revelation 19. So today, is there a bride of Christ? No. We're, we're espoused to Christ, but we won't be the bride until Revelation 19, when the bride makes herself ready, clothed in the righteousness of the saints, which is not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith, we will stand without spot, without blemish, and be presented to Christ as his bride. Who will be in this assembly is the question. Who will be in it? Well, the obvious answer that you're probably thinking, Pastor Anderson, why would you ask such a silly question? Obviously, it's just every believer, everyone who's saved. But let me tell you something. There's a false doctrine out there that says it's not everybody who's saved. And I'm going to disprove that right now. Unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt, you will see it in the Bible. That this is every believer who has ever lived that will be a part of this group, the church, the bride of Christ in heaven. There's these people that are called Baptist Briders. This guy said, you know, one of our church members came to me and said to me this week, what's a brider? I was like, what? He's like, bride or non-brider? I said, what are you talking about? Yeah. But then it clicked, I remember, because I hadn't heard about this in so many years. But I guess it's coming back in style among some people. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, like the trends from the 70s, like start to come back and people start wearing bell bottoms again. This is one of those things that like, I thought it had died, but now it's back in fashion, it's back in style. And it's the, it's the, it's a false doctrine. I'll prove it to you, false. And you know, if you want to go hang on to your tradition, then go right ahead. But I'm going to let the Bible be my authority here. I'll show you what the truth is. I don't care what, what these uh, false teachers say. I don't care what Peter Ruckman says, who teaches this garbage. Peter Ruckman, who's been uh, divorced twice, married to his third wife, and yet he still is a pastor, when the Bible says a pastor is supposed to be the husband of one wife. And so uh, I don't care what he says. I don't care what, I don't care what anybody says except what Jesus says. Amen. That's all I care about. And so let's see in the Bible, who makes up this group? You're saying, Pastor Anderson... Come on. It's all believers. But these Baptist writers, you know what they believe? It's only people who went to an independent Baptist church while they lived on this earth. Now the first thing I want to say is show me that in the Bible. They say, well, because it's the church, you had to be part of a church while you were on this earth. And it had to be a church that's pastored by somebody who was baptized by somebody, who was baptized by somebody, who was baptized by somebody, all the way back to John the Baptist, with not, without a break in that chain. How could you even prove that? How could anybody even know that? You see what I'm saying, how bizarre this is? But they will stand up and say, and we were criticized this week, they said, oh yeah, well, you know, they're trying to find something wrong with us because we win more souls than, than they won in the whole year. We win that many in one week. Amen. And they say, oh man, that church is non brighter but let, me, let me just explain something. If you have to come up with some cute little term to define what you believe, if it's brighter and non bright, it's probably wrong. It's probably false if it has such a dumb name. But look down at your Bible. I'm going to prove to you that this church in heaven, one day, and man, isn't it going to be great to be up there assembled with everybody who's been saved? Amen. All, your lo all your loved ones that were believers who've already died and gone on before you, all the people that you won to Christ, you're going to be standing side by side with them, singing the praise of God in a perfect place in heaven. Amen. Man, it's going to be great. Amen. If you're one of the few. <laughs> no, no. It's if you were saved. And I'll prove that to you. 
Okay? Who is it that's going to be there? Well, let's look at Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 21. You say, oh man, it's kind of deep for a Sunday morning. I'm not going to get up here and just rattle my cage every Sunday morning. You need to learn the Bible. We need to learn doctrine. We don't want... Well, we shouldn't let people uh, say things to us and, 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 and spin things on us and we don't even know what they're talking about. Let's know what we believe. If somebody tries to pull this on you, say, hey, show me in the Bible this brighter. I'll show you in the Bible where it's false. And let me show you right now. It says in verse uh, 1 of chapter 21, we're going to go through the whole chapter of Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the, and we're looking at every mention of the bride in the New Testament, by the way. It says, and for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. By the way, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that this world's going to be here forever. What does it say in verse 1? The first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away. The earth and all things therein shall be burned up. 2 Peter chapter 3. This world's not going to be here forever. It says, uh, the heaven and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Right? So right now it's in heaven. One day it's going to descend to the new earth. It says... Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So what's prepared as a bride? The new Jerusalem descending down from heaven, right? It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. Who is that? The believer. First John 5, 4. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Right. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now keep in mind, the only mentions of the bride in the entire New Testament are John chapter 3 and the end of the book of Revelation, which we're reading all the verses. We're not skipping anything, okay? Tell me where you think they come up with this stuff. It says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. Which mountain is that? Mount Zion, right? We saw that in Hebrews 12. And showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall of great, I'm sorry, a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the twelve gates twelve angels, which and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of the reed. What is a furlong? Anybody know? How many yards are in a furlong? A, a furlong is an eighth of a mile. Exactly. So if a furlong is an eighth of a mile, and it's 1,200 furlongs, then uh, I'm going to have my math genius here in the front row tell me how many miles is that? 12, or I'm sorry, 12,000 furlongs, and a furlong is an eighth of a mile. Go. 1,500 miles. He beats you to the punch. I, I've lost all faith in you. Just being bad. <laughs> so we're talking about 1,500 miles. The length and the breadth of it are equal. It says, and he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is an angel. And the building of the wall of it was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like under clear gas, glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. He lists the stones. I'll skip it for sake of time. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. That's where you get the streets of gold, right? We talk about in heaven. 
And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are what? Saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. You say, now wait a minute, that just says those that are saved will walk in the light of it. But only those Baptists, <laughs> church members, will be on the inside. Well, let's keep reading. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. That's my kid's favorite verse in the whole Bible. No night there. Your kids hate going to bed at night. Every kid, it's like they think they're dying or something. Like they're just never going to wake up again. If you tell them that it's time to go to bed, oh, I'm playing up. Oh, yeah, it's a good night. You're going to go to sleep in five seconds. It'll be morning. But they hate going to bed. No night there, kids, right? <laughs> you just said, I don't want night. All right, and so it says, And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. So even a single lie excludes you, but thanks be to God, all our sins are gone. As far as the east is, I mean, look, if one lie keeps you out of heaven, nobody's going to heaven. And, and, but you know what? Thanks be to God, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. But watch this. Or whatsoever maketh, work of the abomination, or maketh they lie. Who's going to be in there? Who's going to enter in? Who will enter into the city? They which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Does it say them which are written in the rolls of a Baptist church in the United States of America or anywhere else? It says those that will be a part of the bride of Christ. Those that will be in that great city where the streets are of gold. But you say, where does that church in heaven meet? Where does the bride of Christ meet? Where does that church meet? It meets at Mount Zion in the heavenly Jerusalem. And everybody who is in the Lamb's book of life, according to Revelation 21, 27, will waltz through that door, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You say, what if they haven't been baptized? Their name is still in the Lamb's book of life. What if they went to a church that was not independent Baptist? Their name is still in the Lamb's right. Book of Life if they are a believer. Now, many of these other denominations, of course, are unbelievers. They're adding works. I mean, the Catholics are adding works. I mean, the, the Methodists are saying you lose your salvation. They're adding works. The Presbyterians are adding works with their perseverance of the saints. If you didn't do the work, you weren't really saved. And... Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. Anybody who goes to any church or no church, been baptized or not baptized, if they are a believer, if their name is written in the last book of life, they will be part of the church in heaven, the bride of Christ. Call me what you want. non brider One of those non brider churches. Okay. Well, could that be any more clear? We just read the whole chapter. I didn't see anything mentioning what church people went to or did not go to. All I saw was those that are saved. All I saw was the Lamb's Book of Life. All I saw is people whose sins are forgiven. They're going to walk through those gates into the city. That's what it says. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. Only those believers from the church age make up the bride of Christ. Now, the briders are, are that's a strange doctrine. That's off the wall. You say, I never even heard of that. I've heard of it many times. But, it, you know, it's coming back in style, I guess. It's been gone for a while. I, thought, I, I don't know, maybe somebody believed it somewhere. But, I'll tell you this. I'll bet you that 95 to 99% of independent fundamental Baptists will disagree with what I'm about to say right now. But I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible right now. You decide who you're going to believe. The crowd or the Bible. Oh, here, here's a great way to live your life, too. If everybody's doing it, it's, it's probably right. That's not, you know what I mean? Yeah, if everybody else is doing it, it's probably good. The Bible says, no, I should not follow a multitude to do evil. Look, just because everybody does it and everybody says it, doesn't make you right. That's right. Amen. When the Bible says it, that's what makes you right. Amen. Okay. And so, I'm going to disagree right now with 95 to 99% of independent political bats who would say, only those believers from the church age will be a part of this group in the bride of Christ. Now, wait a minute. The, what did the Bible say was the criteria for being in this group? Saved? Were people in the Old Testament saved? Absolutely. Were people in the Old What was the other criteria according to Revelation 21? All sins must be forgiven because not even, not even a liar could enter it. Well, didn't David 
saved. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Old Testament saying. And what was the third criteria? Is that they had to have their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Guess what? Old Testament saints had their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus said to his disciples that their names were in the Lamb's Book of Life before he died on the cross with buried and rose again. Uh, Moses talked about the Lamb's Book of Life in Exodus 32. He said, blot out my name out of the Book of Life if you're going to destroy this people. God was unable to do that because Moses was saved. He can't lose his salvation. He said, I'll blot out those that have sinned against me. And he said uh, in, in uh, Psalm, and this is Old Testament, Psalm chapter 69, 27, Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. That's where the righteous are written. The land of life. Remember it said the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven? And so, those who are written in the book of life, Old Testament, New Testament, the names of those who've been saved have always been recorded in the land of life. You got Exodus 32, you got Psalm 69, Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stand for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, or tribulation is what that means, such as never was since there was a nation to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Who's going to be in the rapture? Everyone that's found written in the book, he said. Everyone who's in the land book of life will be delivered. Now look, don't tell me that, oh, well, this is the church age. Brother, can you show me that in the Bible, the church age? Can you show me that? Oh, you can show me in your theology book. You can show me in your commentary. I've chosen a captain called the church age. Oh the, oh, the age of grace and the age of law and the age of innocence. The age of... These are not terms found in the Bible. I don't believe in seven dispensations. I don't believe in any dispensations. I'm not a dispensationalist. I, that you say, oh, uh, hey, I believe in the, this is the only division I make, Old Testament, New Testament. That's the one that God makes. There's no dispensations in the Bible. You say, oh, prove it. Okay, I'll, I'll prove everything to you. Look, if you would, at Ephesians. You say, well, I can't, I'm trying to find the church age in the Bible. Oh, wait, I found it. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. I found it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. Oh, you have to understand, Pastor Anderson, it's only those believers from the church age that will be a part of the bride of Christ. Okay, well, let's look at Ephesians 3.21. What does the Bible say in Ephesians 3.21? This is the only time you'll find any mention of the church age in the Bible. It says, now unto, I'm sorry, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages. Amen. You say, wait a minute, how could Jesus Christ be glorified in the church throughout all ages? Because let me tell you something. They had the, the church was around in the Old Testament. Woo! Yes, it is. Acts. Look at Acts seven thirty eight. Acts seven thirty eight. Oh no, the church began the day of Pentecost. Well, let's look at Acts. Oh, the church began with John the Baptist. The church didn't even begin with John the Baptist. The church was around in the Old Testament, my friend. Deal with it. And Old Testament saints will be in the church in heaven because their names are in the book of life. Because their sins are forgiven. Because they're saved. Just like I'm saved. But look, Acts 7.38. Let's let the Bible be the authority. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Who was in the church in the wilderness? Moses. Who was the pastor of the church in the wilderness? Moses. And they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, there goes your church age, because Moses was preaching to the church in the wilderness. With the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with all fathers who received the light of the oracles to give unto us. You see, in Psalm 22, 22, and it, while, you're, while I'm reading this, turn to Exodus 33. I'll show you the church in the Old Testament. Look at Exodus 33. See, in Psalm 22, 22, the Bible reads, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. In the midst of the what? Congregation, well, I praise thee. That verse is quoted in Hebrews 2.12 as saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Those two words must be the same word. In Greek, it's called the church. In Hebrew, it's called the congregation. They both mean the same thing. Which is why you'll never find the word church in the Old Testament. And you'll only one time find the word congregation in the New Testament. But 99% of the time, it's called church. And they even translate a verse from the Old Testament, Psalm 22, 22, into Hebrews 2, 12 as church. In the midst of the church, in the midst of the congregation. The two are synonymous. A church is an assembly, a congregation of people. 
But look, look at this. Where did I turn? Exodus. Exodus 33. Look at verse 6. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of what? The congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. The congregation in the Old Testament was a place that was separate from the rest of the world, separated, we believe in separation of the church, separation where the people come out of the world, out to God, without the camp, outside the crowd, outside what's popular, outside the mainstream, and they gathered themselves unto Moses, and they called it the congregation, outside the camp, with Moses, uh, hearing preaching of God's word. Look, I'm not the one who called it the church. That was Stephen. Now, my name is Stephen, too. But don't, don't confuse me with the Stephen in the Bible, okay? It was, you know, uh, Stephen L. Anderson. No, it was Stephen, whatever his last name was, that made it up. He's the one who stood up filled with the Holy Ghost and said Moses was with the church in the wilderness. So I'm preaching the same thing that my namesake of 2,000 years ago was preaching. They stoned him for it. Uh, I'm probably going to be left here. I'm going to go out to lunch after the service. And so, but I'm preaching the same thing. It's the same teaching. And so he said Moses was with the church in the wilderness. Unto him be glory in the church of by Jesus Christ throughout all ages. World without end. Amen. And so we see that the church is nothing new. The church is something that's been an assembly of God's people back in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. And there will be a church in heaven for all eternity. World without end. Amen. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. But the new earth is never going to end. And so we see it's pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, it's pretty clear that every single believer of all time will be in that group. You can't show me one verse in the entire Bible that says that anyone will be excluded from this. Now, here's, here's, their, here's their big verse. Now, I showed you some pretty clear verses, right? Pretty conclusive that the people in the Old Testament were in the Book of Life. Pretty conclusive that everyone who's written the Book of Life is going to be in that city. It's amazing because the city where the church is being held, did you notice that the gates and the foundations are named after what? Well, 12 of them are named after the apostles of the Lamb, and 12 of them are listed after the 12 tribes of Israel, which is the Old Testament. See what I'm saying? So there's an Old Testament and a New Testament connotation in that church building. Okay? And so there's no difference. But look down if you would at... Uh, did I tell you to turn some more yet? John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm trying to hurry. I don't want to go too long, but... John chapter 3 is their big scripture. This is it, guys. This is the biggie. This is the one that teaches that if you don't go to an independent fundamental Baptist church that was baptized by somebody who was baptized by somebody who... I don't, the guy who baptized me, I don't know who baptized him. Let alone who baptized him or baptized him or baptized him. That's insane. But this is the verse, guys, that proves that if you weren't baptized in an independent Baptist church, you're going to be left out in the cold. You won't walk on the streets. But now you get to go to heaven... You're saved, but you're not part of the bride. That's what they teach, based on this one verse. Look at John chapter 3. And, and this is it, guys. Brace yourself. It says in John 3, 27, John answered, said this is John the Baptist, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ. John the Baptist saying, look, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. But that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, so John the Baptist is saying, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. There you have it, folks. The Baptist bride. You saw it, didn't you? <laughs> well, I didn't see it either. <laughs> but this is their this is their proof text. This is it. And this is their logic. They say, well, see? John the Baptist was not part of the bride because he was the friend of the bridegroom. Therefore, all Old Testament saints are left out and anybody who's not a member of a church uh, that was an independent Baptist. Well, here's the problem with that. Number one, wasn't his name John the Baptist? So if he's left out, what, you know what I mean? I mean that's, it seems like it's disproving. Number two, wasn't John the Baptist a New Testament believer? I think the book of Matthew is in the New Testament, and Mark and Luke and John. But they say, well, it was before Jesus died. Oh, really? Is that why Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John? 
Until then is the kingdom of God and every man presseth into it. So what didn't John the Baptist mark the beginning of the New Testament according to Jesus Christ? Here's what you have to understand. John here is not talking about the church. He's using an illustration. He's saying, look, I'm not the bridegroom. I'm like the best man. He's using a parable here, saying, it's not about me. Now look, at a wedding, who's the main event? The bride and the bridegroom is the main event. Nobody gets all excited about the best man. The best man doesn't invite all his relatives and friends from all over to the wedding. Because they're his friends and his relatives. Look, your best man, his immediate family was not even at the wedding, right? Your best man, I mean, his immediate family was, was not able to make it. So who was the main event? Not the best man, but the bridegroom. His brother Dave's friends and family and everybody were there. But his best man's friends and family were not necessarily there. John the Baptist is saying, it's not about me. He must increase, I must decrease. He said, Jesus is the bridegroom. I'm sort of like the best man. You know, I'm introducing him. I'm his forerunner. Obviously, but see, what happens is people take these parables and they take them too far. They start mixing parables together. Okay? Like, I mean, think about it. There's a... There's a a parable where Jesus is sowing the word. Follow me carefully. Jesus is sowing the word. Sowing the word. And, and uh, you know, some seed falls on the good ground. Some falls... What does the ground represent in that story? You know, people who hear the word of God. People who are hearing the preaching. He talks about uh, the one where the, 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 the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. Do you remember that parable? And the ground... What did the field represent? The world. The, Jesus said the field is the world. The reapers are the angels. The harvest is the end of the world. So in that one, the field is the world. Then he tells another parable about how a man goes and finds in a field a pearl of great price. Right? He finds a treasure. He goes and sells all he has and buys the field so he can have that pearl. So what did he do? I guess he bought the whole world. Do you see what I mean? You can't mix together parables. I mean, in one parable, the field could represent one thing. In another parable, the field represents something else. It's, a, it's, a, it's just an illustration, okay? Just because he said the field, the world, and that parable, it doesn't mean the field's always the world. And John the Baptist here is using a totally different illustration. He's just saying, look, it's not about me. I'm not Christ. The bridegroom is one thing. The best man is something else. John the Baptist is a part of the bride of Christ. I'll prove it to you further. In one illustration that Jesus did, I'm skipping a, a whole page of my message here for the sake of time. So if you think I'm preaching too long, there could have been a whole other page. So Matthew 20, in Matthew 22, don't, you don't have to turn there, I'll just tell you for the sake of time. In Matthew 22, there's a story about the wedding feast. Remember? And they go out and invite everybody. They go into highways and hedges and invite everybody to the marriage feast and the marriage supper. In that story, the people who are saved are the guests at the wedding. Remember? All the guests. In Matthew 25, those who are saved are the guests. In Matthew 25, those who are saved are the, are the bridesmaids in the story who didn't take oil in their lamps. Okay? And so look, in one illustration, the, they're the guests. In one illustration, they're the bridesmaids. And remember the guy who didn't have the wedding garment on? He was the guest. He's thrown out because he didn't have that robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ. But yet, in, when it talks about in Revelation, the bride of Christ, when, when it's referring to the church of the living God in Hebrews chapter 12, okay, that's talking about believers who, who, who are the bride. So to say, well, no, John the Baptist, I mean, look, are you really going to base everything you believe on John the Baptist saying an illustration about a bride and a bridegroom, which he never even mentions any other details, he just says, well, the bridegroom is one thing, and the, the friend of the bridegroom, you know, rejoices. I'm the best man of Jesus. I'm his best man. And Jesus said he's the best man that ever lived. Remember that? Are you really going to let that negate the clear teaching of the Bible everywhere else that says if you're saved, if you're named to the book of life, if you're a believer, you will be a part of that group in heaven? When they're sitting there saying that this proves that Old Testament believers were not part of it, when John the Baptist is New Testament, and when his name is the Baptist, and they say you have to be a Baptist to be up in this group, and yet John the Baptist is not allowed in the group? Good night. If there ever was a Baptist, I guess it would be John the Baptist. But he's going to be left out in the cold, according to these people. 
And so we see these strange doctrines. The Bible says, be not carried about, listen to me, with divers and strange doctrines. Let It's a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Let your heart be fixed and established on what the Bible clearly says and teaches. No mention in the Bible of being a member of an independent Baptist church puts you in a special group in heaven. Now, if you're a member of an independent Baptist church, if it's the right kind of church, which is not a given, since many independent Baptist churches teach as much heresy as anybody else, you know, you're going to learn how to win souls, you're going to be a better Christian, you're going to hear better preaching. But you know what? No matter who you are, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will walk on the streets of gold and walk into the city, and you will sit out in the church and come sit next to me in that great assembly one day, and we'll sing God's praises together. That's what the Bible says. Don't let your heart and mind rest on man's teaching for what you believe. So who is the bride? Let, let's review quick. Who is the bride of Christ? Doesn't exist. One day it will exist on the wedding day in Revelation 19. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And who's going to be there? Every believer from Abel, from Adam, all the way to the last person to get saved in this whole world. That's who's going to be there. Every believer. Old Testament, New Testament, people who never went to church. People who never darkened the door of a church. People